I'm so happy to be here today with Alex Wang, co-founder and CEO of Scale AI, such a fascinating company at a fascinating time for the business of artificial intelligence. Alex, thank you so much for talking to us today. First, why don't you start off by explaining what is Scale AI? I'm so excited to be here, Julia. So um, Scale, we accelerate the development of artificial intelligence. So we do this by providing the label data sets and tools necessary for companies who don't necessarily have the expertise to deploy AI as easily as they deploy code. So we serve as a trusted partner to organizations to build a systematic data-centric platform to manage their entire machine learning lifecycle. One way I like to put it is these artificial intelligence algorithms, they're kind of like children. You know, they really, uh, they need great information and great food to be able to learn. And we're kind of like the chefs that help prepare raw ingredients to food for these AI algorithms to learn. You've got to feed the kids healthy food. So uh, Alex, explain to us what types of customers you have, who your clients are, and what types of tools you're giving them. There are a lot of AI companies out there. I know that people hear a lot about how AI is used in all sorts of different ways, but in particular, give us some examples and sort of the range of companies you work with. Yeah, I think one of the very exciting things that we've seen just over the past few years in the industry of AI is just this explosion of different use cases of the technology where it's being used in everyday life uh, in a lot of ways that many of us don't even realize, such as using to power um, even old school businesses like banks, all the way to powering the daily TikTok feeds that we use. So for, for us at scale, you know, we work on a wide variety of applications such as autonomous vehicles, e-commerce, financial services, and a lot of others. So for example, we work with Toyota Research Institute to uh, create data sets to power their self-driving car algorithms. We work with States Title uh, to build algorithms to help them uh, revolutionize the home buying process. We worked with Honey, which is a subsidiary of PayPal to validate and categorize all the items that are, that are in their catalog to provide a great e-commerce buying experience. We work with leading medical researchers on automating uh, medical image analysis so that we can uh, allow for a scalable process to diagnose images and cancer for the global population. And then we partnered with a major logistics provider to provide greater efficiency and ensure that even in COVID, we're able to, to still deliver all the packages on time to everyone who needs them. Amazing. Now, I want to get to your origin story, but I think what you just mentioned in all of those different examples really speaks to where we are right now in AI. You know, when you hear AI, people think about totally autonomous self-driving cars where people never get near a steering wheel, or they think about flying cars, or they think about, you know, robotic doctors. But what you're describing now is how artificial intelligence can enable people um, and pre-existing systems to do their jobs better. Explain to us sort of where you see us in the life cycle of AI in terms of being a help and um, an additional tool um, to, for these companies and employees to have in their to toolkits rather than something that really replaces the average worker. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I think that where we are right now and frankly where we'll be for the next few decades is always as, as AI as a helper or AI as a as kind of like an assistant that makes sure that you can do your jobs effectively. So for example, if we think about autonomous vehicles, you know, we've talked so much about, hey, you know, we're gonna have these robot cars that are gonna drive us around and that's gonna be the, the future we live in. Well, if you look at where the technology is, is today and where it's being used, you know, it's used in systems like uh, Tesla Autopilot where, you know, it's helping us be able to drive from place to place, but it's not totally taking the wheel or it's being used um, in trucking, for example, to as a helper to prevent accidents and be a driver assistance to prevent any sort of really crazy situations, but it's still, um, you, you know, the person is still there and needs to drive. And, and, you know, we see this not only in autonomous vehicles, but also in other circumstances, such as the medical industry. You know, it's not, we're not fully offloading diagnosis decisions to any machine learning algorithms. We know that, that the AI technology isn't there yet. What we're doing is we're using it to help us to make sure that we you know, that doctors or nurses are looking at all the possible signals and that we're not missing anything in the process of diagnosing a, uh, a patient or that in the process of, of, of um, serving the patient that we don't accidentally miss something that, that could be important for their care. So AI to augment uh, the, the people at your customers exactly. that are already doing all of this work. So tell us about your origin story. I think it's amazing that you founded 
this massive company when you were just 19 years old. You've since then raised hundreds of millions of dollars of founding and funding. But tell us your founding story. Yeah, no, I, I uh, you know, I love telling this story. I, I founded the company in 2016 and um, I was in school at MIT and I was actually studying artificial intelligence and machine learning because it was it was this topic that, you know, it, it was so clear to me that it would have this incredible impact on the world and it was so powerful. Um, and I wanted to really understand it deep, more deeply and, and be able to study it. And, and while at MIT, one thing that's, that's crazy is that, um, you know, everybody's building something. You know, students are making robots if they're electrical engineering, engineering majors or coding apps uh, if they're computer science majors. Um, but, but almost nobody was actually building anything with AI or, or machine learning despite the fact that there were hundreds of brilliant students who were all studying it. And, and I tried to, take, uh, tried to take a pass myself at this. I tried to build a, uh, a camera inside my fridge that could tell me uh, when to refill my groceries. You know, I, I always would forget things when I, was at the, when I was at the grocery store. And so I wanted to be able to, to always know and use AI to help me with that. And, and I tried, you know, I actually worked on this for, for um, you know, more than a month. I got a camera, I outfitted it in my, uh, in my fridge, and I tried to train an algorithm to tell me when certain things were missing. And, uh, and what I realized is because I just, I didn't have any of the data, uh, I couldn't build anything that was actually useful. Uh, and uh, I realized this like a few weeks in where I was like, hey, you know, the data is going to be the bottleneck. Data is kind of like the key here. And, and so it caused me to realize that, not only for me as a college student or my peers as college students on campus, but for every organization that wanted to do AI, whether that's a bank or a hospital or uh, an automaker, you know, the, the big bottleneck for them all to be able to apply AI was actually around the data. And I could, I felt this viscerally when I was, uh, when I was 19 and uh, thankfully because of the, you know, um, the mythology around these young founders. I felt I felt enough conviction to be able to take the leap, um, and uh, and and so we took this thesis on, and it ended up being right. We were able to significantly accelerate the AI life cycles and the AI journeys of so many of our partners just by helping them with the data and providing them with tools to to allow them to move faster. So ultimately, AI algorithms are useless if you don't have data to feed those algorithms, right? Yeah, exactly. So how much of your how much of your work is with companies that already have all the data that you need to help them? And how much of it is telling companies, look, you need to be tracking this, or this is actually what the most important thing is, or we should be gathering data even if you don't think you're going to need it because two years from now, our algorithms might, right? Tell us how you work with companies to address that piece of the fuel that you need for your AI machines. It's a great question, Julia. And, and actually we see, you know, it's kind of all over the place. There are some organizations um, in particular, you know, tech companies have always, uh, have always um, you know, thought about it in this way, but there's some organizations where they've, they've always been trying to figure out how do we, um, how do we make sure that we, we, don't, we don't just lose any data and that we always have this data just in case we need to build algorithms um, in the future. And um, it, and it goes all the way to older school businesses. You know, you can imagine like uh, like a retailer where they haven't had to think about the data, and so they they just have been in a situation where they haven't been collecting all the data they need. And one thing we like to tell our customers is, hey, if you don't collect data today, the, you're stealing from the future because you know collecting all this data is really what's going to be the foundation for the next phase of industry where artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to be necessary to be competitive. You know, we, we always tell folks that if you're not thinking about your data strategy and, and your AI strategy today, then you're going to be left behind in the future because it's just, it takes time to build a coherent data strategy. It takes time to build an AI strategy and it takes time to get all the pieces working together because of how complex the technology is. So what I want to know, though, is how you as a 19-year-old didn't just build a strategy and approach, but actually build a, built a business. Um, you know, the company is now valued at more than $3.5 billion, which is remarkable in just five years' time. And so I'm wondering how you use your approach and your idea that, okay, we need the data, then we have the approach to make this data valuable for companies, and how you started to, to pitch to both investors and also to clients. 
Yeah, so what we had been noticing is um, this, in particular, this process that I mentioned where you have to, you know, you might have all the data, which would be sort of the raw ingredients or the raw, um, the raw uh, ingredients for, for a recipe, but you still need to, to cook all of it and you still need to prepare all of it so that the, the algorithms can actually eat it. And, um, and what I noticed is that this, this mill process in particular of preparing all the ingredients you know, there were there were some researchers in the in the industry who are uh, who are really approaching it in a novel way and thinking about interesting um, interesting approaches. But uh, but most of the industry was still tackling it in in kind of a stone age way, which is which is something that you you know you always see um, in these industries is that there's always some you know way in which people are approaching problem which is stuck in the past. And, and so I knew that like, hey, we, we're going to have to revolutionize this. We're going to have to make it more efficient, make it more tech enabled. We're going to have to apply some of these brilliant research methods that people are discovering to this problem. And so our approach has always been, how do we take this, this process of preparing the data, which has historically just been um, very manually and very uh, sort of uh, done in a very blunt force way, how do we make that smart and efficient mm -hmm. and, and well, use technology to do that? But you also have to do it in a way that is careful to avoid bias. I know there's been a lot of different types of concerns about AI, both data being used and gathered inappropriately. And then also increasingly, there's an awareness that bias can be baked into AI in a way that has massive implications. How do you avoid that? Yeah, I, I think that bias as, a, as an AI community is one of the biggest problems that we need to be solving today, especially if you want this technology to be used in the future. You know, the problems with stuff like bias and accuracy are that it's actually so critical to the foundation of AI, as you mentioned. You know, you, you are what you eat. So if you have bad data, you're gonna, have, you're gonna have bad AI. And so we've tackled this problem in partnership with many of our many of our customers, as well as in partnership with the research community, to figure out what are the best approaches to, to solve this problem. And so our products like Nucleus, we've built to help customers first just identify when they might have problems with bias. You know, you you, you won't be able to solve the problem, so you know you actually have the problem, and and that empowers them to be able to fix it. Let's say you have a data set where you've realized that eighty percent of the data. Um, to power the algorithm is from male patients and only 20% is from female patients. Well, then we use our tech to identify that that's the case and then we fix those problems. And we've done this in the past with, for example, there's this very seminal data set in the industry called the Connell 2003 data set, which we noticed this exact problem where there was, there was gender bias in the data set. And it was being used as this foundational data set for research and machine learning. But if you actually went and looked at the data, it was, it was severely gender biased. And so we went in, we identified the problem, and then we helped uh, empower them to fix it. You know, other, other biases that we really take care of with our customers, we work with a lot of customers in the financial sector, uh, like Brex and State Title and others. Um, and, uh, and for example, credit decisions can become very biased based on the demographics of the data that you're using to train those algorithms. Or, or when we work with self-driving companies like Toyota, driving safety can be impacted by, are you driving more at night versus daytime? What neighborhoods are you driving in? And so it's a very insidious problem uh, that we're, we're really focused on making sure that we have the visibility and the, the tools to be able to, to address. Yeah, and it sounds like that's something that you really have to be looking at multiple layers. Is the, is the bias already there? Is the bias in the algorithm rather than in the data set? So a really complicated issue. When you think about your efforts to make sure that your work is unbiased and also about these sort of larger concerns about the potential power of AI, who should be scrutinizing that? What is the importance of third-party organizations? Yeah, I, I think it's absolutely critical. I mean, just in the same way where um, in the process of building, building software, we've built so much um, of an industry around testing the software, ensuring there's no bugs. And when there are bugs that cause real world problems, you know, we hold organizations accountable for that. And, and I think we need, we need similar things for, for AI. The only difference is that, you know, in AI, it's not just about the code, it's about the data too. And so we have to take really good care of what is the data we're putting in these systems. Fascinating conversation, amazing company that has grown so quickly to a valuation of over three and a half billion dollars, founded when you, of course, and Alex were only 19 years old. Thank you for joining us today to talk not only about your company's scale, but also about some of these big questions and challenges facing this powerful tool 
of artificial intelligence. Really appreciate you joining me for this conversation. And now I'm going to toss it back over to Collision.